Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm really excited to chat with Patrick Sentner, uh, who, who's who been with the SIOR for 20 years, I believe, Patrick. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? 20th anniversary uh, this year. Well, congratulations. Do you, do you get a, a, a nicer pin, like a diamond encrusted pin? Or I actually do get a new pin. That is exactly oh. the case. Well, that's exciting. I'll, be, I'll look forward to seeing that <laughs> when it goes in. Uh, so uh, the format for uh, this interview is we're going to jump into uh, Patrick's experience, even going beyond SIOR, uh, to to your background on how you got started in the industry. Uh, I, I know your story, but I, I will ask you to share that in a minute here as well. Uh, and then really just dive into uh, commercial real estate brokerage. Uh, I really want to get your thoughts on, on recommendations that you'd have for new agents, uh, what you'd have for experienced agents as well, and then even dive in into what people could do if they wanted to start a brokerage on their own from scratch. Uh, so before we get into that, uh, again, just hello to everyone. Uh, I'd love to uh, have your questions come in uh, at any point in the interview and uh, just say hello. That's, uh, that always means a lot as well. Uh, so uh, with, with that, Patrick, thanks again so much for coming on the show. Uh, can you please share uh, just your background and, and how you got into commercial real estate and how it led you to where you are today? Absolutely, Chad. I have been in brokerage now for a little over 25 years. And coming out of college, I had absolutely no clue what commercial real estate brokerage was. Didn't even realize it was an industry. Uh, went right into banking, uh, did a couple years as a credit analyst and as a management trainee, and then eventually got into uh, commercial lending and did a lot on the commercial real estate side, which is what really introduced me to the industry. Uh, met a broker who was working on a project that I was looking to do financing for, and we hit it off. And more importantly, he taught me the industry and taught me what the brokerage side was and really made me realize that I wanted to get into that industry. I wanted the excitement and, in essence, the risk associated with being a broker. And sure enough, when he left to uh, start the third party uh, brokerage group for a development company here in Pittsburgh, I followed suit, uh, worked there for about six years. Then he and I and two other gentlemen from uh, two other firms started our own company. And that was, geez, probably about almost 18 years ago now. And uh, did that for a while. But uh, after running that for a little over 13 years, I got recruited by CBRE. I initially thought it was a joke because I said, folks, you do realize I own my own company. And they said, yes, but do you like this? or this, or this, or this? And the answer was no, 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 and no. And they said, you like taking care of your clients, don't you? And I said, I love taking care of my clients. And ultimately, after about a year, ended up uh, going over to CB. And they actually were smart enough and were recruiting somebody else, uh, a, an SAR broker by the name of Amy Broadhurst. And they paired the two of us together. And we've been working together as a team now for uh, almost four full years, which has been fantastic. So take me back to those those early days. What was what was your career like when you were just getting started? It was interesting because in my mind, I thought I was doing a horrible job. <laughs> All I was doing on a daily basis was making a ton of calls. And, you know, I probably averaged 50 to 100 calls a day uh, for nine months, gathered a lot of information uh, but other than a sublease listing, didn't get any business out of it. However, at the end of the year, um, two of the people in our company who were both SIORs at the time uh, offered me a, to be part of their partnership, which I thought was quite odd because in my mind, I'm like, how good can I be? I'm not producing anything. However, looking back 25 years later, I would love to have somebody coming into my shop, you know, who wants to work with me and make 50 to 100 calls a day and not let it, you know, slow them down. So, you know, immediately upon being part of the group, then it started making sense because those calls were starting to turn into uh, deals the following year and the ball really started getting rolling quickly. And it was a lot of fun at that point in time. So 25 years later, if you were to start all over again, would you follow the same system of just diving into making a lot of calls? No. Um, and I don't say that because I still believe calling is extraordinarily important. Um, the key is to make sure that you're doing that, but you're doing that with 
a mentor or somebody that's either A, your partner, or B, could be your partner. Because it doesn't matter how many calls you're making. If you don't know what to do with that information, if you don't have someone who can guide you on to the next step, you might get that meeting. But what do you do when you're in that meeting? Uh, it was funny because uh, probably for the first five or six years of my career, almost my entire pitch was the same as my partners. And I shouldn't say pitch because it was he was passionate and loved the business. That's who I learned from. So as a result, I knew how to handle client meetings. And without having that, if I was just making the calls and trying to do you know the meetings on my own, I would have been lucky to have closed a quarter of the uh, meetings that I ultimately ended up getting. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And I, and I think that that's a resounding comment that we hear from people all the time is that having a mentor sure accelerates the learning curve and helps somebody develop a lot quicker than they would on their own. So assuming somebody does have someone that they could either partner with or collaborate with, what what would you recommend to someone that's just starting out and wants to start building a book of business? And and you can go in whatever direction you feel fit on this, but it, it, would that be identifying a certain group of, of companies that you want to prospect to get tenant representation work or would that be working to call landlords and if so how would you systematize that so that you actually have a system to work off of so the first thing is to become an expert in a market so every market has you know anywhere from four to five or six different sub markets within it and one of the most important things is to become an actual expert in one of those sub markets I ended up doing the bulk of my calling on two different sub markets. And in turn, after that year, maybe not 100 percent, but I knew almost every company out in those particular markets. I also knew virtually every landlord in that particular those particular sub markets. At that point in time, you know, I always like specialization. And that's one thing I've learned has really helped separate you know, the top brokers from good brokers. And that is figure out if you are going to be an office, for example, and you are focused on it, like in my case, it was the Parkway West Airport corridor market of Pittsburgh. Then decide, all right, I'm not going to try to get listings from landlords if I'm also going to be trying to get uh, tenant rep assignments from the tenants. Some people are very good at that. In my mind, I have to be focused on one. So I focused on the tenant side of it. So all of my calls from that point in time were talking with the tenants in each of those markets. Again, you can do both, but you know, it would have to be someone much smarter than I am because my brain can only focus, you know, on one level of expertise in order for me to get to that, you know, quote unquote expert level in a particular submarket. I love that point. And I want to dive deeper into there uh, because I, I want to flush out how how you w view being an expert and then how someone can go on the same journey to being an expert in their local market. So to me, it was the extra time that you put into your week. And so at that time, my kids were very, very, in fact, you know, in the early stages of my career, I didn't even have kids. So um my wife and I would actually go on drives and I think it drove her crazy because we were just looking at space, but we would go out on Saturdays and sometimes maybe even Sundays after church and just drive around markets, look into parking lots, uh, see which parking lots, you know, seem to have been recently expanded, see what parking lots may still look like bomb zones, you know, where their landlords aren't doing any maintenance or whatever the case might be. And then doing some of the same things after hours work wise so that you could or even during lunch, you drive out to a market and, and if a building is just overflowing with cars, obviously there's an issue there and there's a potential project there for a broker. On the other hand, if there are no cars in a parking lot, that's also an issue as well. So it's taking that extra time to truly know everything about not just you know, reading off a list in CoStar saying, okay, there are 12 tenants in this particular building, but instead going out, seeing how that building is operated, seeing how, you know, the amenities in that building are operated, seeing how the parking lot is operated. 
you can't get that by just sitting at your computer and just looking at, you know, some listings. You actually have to experience it. And, you know, we all know in brokerage, there's only so much time to do those kind of things. So I always like to do that either before uh, business or more importantly, that I always find is, you know, you get in rush hour traffic and then you pull off at that first exit and then look at the office buildings in those areas. And I always found that to be a really good uh, way to become that expert, you know, just understand what it's like to be a tenant in particular buildings or in particular sub markets. It's so interesting. We're on the other side of each other in, on North America. And I say the exact same thing to people uh, for new brokers or even investors. The best thing that you can do is actually to go on a Saturday or a Sunday when these business or industrial parks are slower and there's not a lot of traffic and just physically drive around to see what you pick up. You'll see new listings going up. You might see a sold sign go up. I love the point you made about how a, a tenant that uh, there might not be any cars in the parking lot, uh, or it's a derelict building. These are all things that you pick up that you just can't view from right. a computer screen. So I, I love that point on that. And so it's first, interesting real quick to tie in on that, you know, when you do property tours, so even if you are that expert in, as I said, the airport corridor market, if you haven't driven that market in the past 60 days, don't just set up that tour and then have a client in your car or behind you. And all of a sudden there are two new for lease signs or two new for sale signs that popped up that you knew nothing about because we kind of look silly, you know, when the client, you know, you pull into mm -hmm. that parking lot and say, hey, wait, what is that building next door? You know, how much space do they have? When you see, I don't know, that's not a good thing. <laughs> However, if you would have driven that on the previous Sunday, you would have seen that sign. You would have already called that broker or that landlord to find out what's going there. And again, you would be uh, a much better expert than you would be by just trying to show up. Yeah, it's it's not easy to show that you're an expert, but it's definitely easy to show that you're not an expert. And if you well don't know stated. about a property right across the street <laughs> from the one you're showing, that's a pretty good indication that uh, you're not overly prepared for it. Uh, right. So I, I, maybe one one layer even deeper on this, because I, I, I really want people that, especially if they're new into the industry or considering getting the industry to really get a sense of, of how they can become an expert early on. Uh, in addition to doing regular driving, what else would you recommend to them so that they can uh, accelerate their career or their uh, learning curve as quickly as possible. Well, this is the side that you can then do online, you know, to not just say, okay, XYZ company is in this building. Well, who is XYZ company? Are they part of a holding company? Are they a local entity that, you know, is on the hunt to grow or are they a potential acquisition candidate? These are the kind of things that you can, you know, research you know, online. And if you're looking to represent landlords, it's the same thing. Once you understand the building and the property by driving it, then you might want to say, all right, well, who is this landlord? How long have they owned the building? What is their debt on the building? You know, what is their overall <clears throat> occupancy level? And those are the kind of things, you know, from a research perspective, you need to be doing as well. And, you know, again, I don't care if it's, you know, the tenant side or the landlord side, you need to do that extra research. And that's something I didn't have access to 25 years ago. It was so much more difficult to get, you know, Dun & Bradstreet report or whatever the case might be. Uh, now you can dive into that and, you know, be pretty educated uh, on a relatively quick level, but you need to do that in addition to being out at the sites. Yeah, great point. And I do want to touch on just commercial real estate education, but we'll perhaps leave that a little bit later on because I think that that ties in pretty neatly with SIOR and CCAM, which we talked about earlier. Uh, so we talked about how and the importance of becoming an expert, uh, the importance of having a plan when you're starting to prospect. Let's maybe transition a little bit into the digital side. And and I'm 41, so I'm quite in the middle uh, of of you know, the more senior brokers, as well as the people coming in, uh, you've been doing this for 25 years. So you've got quite a bit of experience. I'm, I'm sure much like you, you were sending faxes like I was when I first started. <laughs> and that's come a long way to everything being a lot more digital, and a lot more online. So how, how would you say that you're implementing social media or just modern technology to be more efficient of a broker? And how would you recommend new people do that as well? So two fronts. Number one, um, on the materials that we can provide. You know, I look at you know how excited I was when we would do maps uh, early on, and we would actually use rub offs where you would get a number that you would rub off off of a you know 
piece of, you know, plastic type paper that would correspond with what you would then have to the side of it to the point now where our assistant can put together a really attractive one page summary of a building with fresh pictures and have the ability to click onto the uh, landlord or the landlord broker brochure all on one page. So that kind of technology makes us look so much better in how we can present to our clients. On the other hand, you know, on the social media side, I'll be the first to admit, you know, that um, early on, I hated Facebook. Uh, so just in general, I tried to avoid that. And I liked LinkedIn, you know, which was a good way to at least know uh, beforehand who I might be meeting with, you know, but I never really dove into it until I got into SIOR leadership. And at that point in time, they started, you know, nudging us uh, a little bit forward, you know, to the point where, you know, while I'm not on TikTok or Instagram, you know, my kids are telling me don't, but on the other hand, I still may end up doing Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn can really help you because it's more than just saying, okay, great. You're meeting with uh, Jill Smith and Jill graduated from the University of Pittsburgh 10 years ago. You can now really understand what kind of personality they have sometimes by, you know, what they may post on LinkedIn. And then you go over to Twitter, which is a little bit more of the personal side of you know, people. And all of a sudden you are walking into a meeting and you really can create some good, you know, conversation topics that you may not have been able to do in the past. So it, it's kind of an exciting way to do it. Um, I do look at it and say that each one should serve its own particular purpose. So I'm not going to go on to Twitter and, you know, go into detail on a new development that one of my clients may be doing. Um, but on the other hand, I'm not going to go on the LinkedIn and say, hey, this Peloton workout I had today was one of the best they ever had, whereby that might work on Twitter. It's definitely not going to work on LinkedIn. Yeah, I, I the, on the point you made about TikTok, I'm I'm resisting it wholeheartedly, <laughs> and I know some people love it and get some value of it. Uh, but I, I don't know if you uh, are uh, following Koi uh, with uh, uh, Colliers in Houston. Mm -hmm. I think that's where he's out of uh, office yep. guy. There, he put Correct. something on Twitter the other day about uh, he just showed a TikTok that was on there, and it was this minute and a half of absolute craziness. Uh, if you go on there and, and check his profile, you're, you'll see it. And I was like, I, I just can't do TikTok just because of that. Uh, so, <laughs> so maybe, maybe someone uh, will, will convince us to do it, and maybe we're just already becoming those old school guys that refuse to <laughs> to look at the newest thing. But I I'm the same way. I, I refuse to do TikTok, but I I have got value from uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and and YouTube uh, of course as well. So I think that's a great point. And uh, on that topic, actually, Bev, uh, thanks for joining in. Thanks for the question uh, related to this uh, question as well, Patrick. How has digital marketing impacted the way you market your brokerage and properties? It's this is one of the beauties of being you know on the uh, experience side, as I'll say, on the tenant side where I don't do a ton to market my brokerage. My partner, Amy, and I, um, you know, do a lot more just personal interaction. You know, we do a lot of corporate service work. So a lot of our uh, interactions are taking care of our existing clients. However, uh, I can tell you that when we are representing tenants, when we have digital marketing opportunities, you know, let's say, you know, so we're at CB and, you know, the, Collier's office has some properties that are going to be on our short list. When they provide us, you know, with digital marketing uh, for their properties, in a weird way, it does make theirs stand out more on our presentations. You know, our clients are then more inclined to, you know, click in on those. And, you know, while our job is never to say, hey, here's 10 properties and here are the three that you should be looking at. You know, we want them to have all the information so that they can make their own determination However, when a couple of those properties have really advanced digital marketing um, brochures with the, our package, they stand that. They really do. And it allows, you know, in a lot of cases, clients, they may have two or three people on a tour where they might have four or five other people who are going to need to make decisions. They can then share those digital marketing and those properties, again, stand out even better. So on that vein, what 
what have you seen that's worked well and perhaps not even necessarily from a corporate standpoint but from a from an individual standpoint what's worked well on social media perhaps from a branding standpoint perhaps it's from a storytelling standpoint perhaps it's just top of mind awareness what have you seen people do well and what have you seen that frustrates you and actually the Ger gerald thanks for joining as well I, I, th I think this is related to it as well. So uh, related to Beverly's question, where do you see the biggest new opportunity for marketing commercial real estate in the 21st century? So related, but two part question, what, what have you seen work well? What hasn't worked well? And to Gerald's question, where do you see opportunities? Number one is consistency. Somebody that might post something that could be really exciting, but they do that, you know, on January 5th, and then you don't hear from them again until, you know, February 20th. That's not going to work. Uh, the, in fact, there are a number of people on social media, you know, some fellow SIORs, some folks that are CCIMs who I follow, and they help me a tremendous amount because I know every Sunday they're coming out with this. Every Wednesday they're coming out with this. And the reason I say that helps me is you know, something that might be happening down in Dallas or Denver or Seattle may not seem to make a ton of or have a ton of relevance to what's happening in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But the reality of it is our clients, especially in this day and age coming out of you know this pandemic, are trying to figure out what are other companies doing? What are other developers doing? What are other landlords doing? And when we can see consistently what's happening in some of these other markets, you know, I look at you know Conrad Madsen, you know, down in you know, Texas. He has actually provided me two or three instances of information that I've used in presentations in Pittsburgh. Hmm. And it's not the actual fact that he's marketing a certain piece of land or a certain development, but it's the groups that are looking and what those groups are looking for. That in turn helps us and it does have relevance throughout the rest of our markets. So it's consistency yeah. number one is by far the biggest opportunity. Uh, you know, because as I said, I've been active on social media now, really active, I should say, for probably the past two and a half years. And there are 10, maybe 15 people who I would say are fantastic at it. Uh, there's a lot of people that are getting better, but the people who are fantastic about it have that consistency. Um, it's not necessarily too in your face, but it's in your face enough that you're not going to just skip over it. And I think that is an extremely important part of being good uh, and taking it to the next level, uh, taking commercial real estate marketing to the next level uh, on social media. Yeah, there's something profound there as well, that it doesn't necessarily need to to be a, a give and take relationship with social media where you need to take something away from it uh, every time uh, to where you get actionable value but it can just be market insights where you might learn something that you didn't know otherwise and like you said you've actually incorporated it into presentations that wouldn't have been feasible 10 years ago uh before we had a platform to share and and mastermind with other people all over the world so yeah i Absolutely. i agree i i i think too many people look at social media as a potential silver bullet where they can go in and all of a sudden start making business and connecting with people. Uh, and, and there is an element of that. And, and I, I've, I've had some success with it, but it was a, it was a long-term process where I've had much more immediate value is like you said, just learning things that you otherwise wouldn't have known. So I think that Absolutely. that really is a, a great thing that new experienced uh, uh, brokers alike can, can benefit from. Uh, so that's perhaps a natural transition where we can go into the experience brokerage side and and you've done the full spectrum of of starting your own firm and now working at a at a large corporate shop so you you can fill in a lot of this information for for agents what would you say to to the to, let's even start really broad just to the brokerage community as a whole coming out of this pandemic what would you be recommending to to people to be focusing on coming into 2022 and beyond talking to as many people as possible in your market and outside your market who are in any way, shape or form related to commercial real estate, whether that be prop tech, whether that be networking organizations, whether that be other shops, other brokers, because as much as, you know, major corporations want to tell you they know exactly what they're doing, candidly, for the first time in my 25 years, I can see that there are very few companies that are 100% sure 
what they're doing with their office space, for example. Um, I've definitely seen some trends. You know, we are absolutely seeing uh, groups focusing on higher end uh, properties, flight to quality, uh, paying higher rents, but getting much, much higher tenant improvement allowances and greater amounts of free rent in exchange for longer terms. And as I said, higher rent, but they're all taking less space. So whether that's a 10% reduction, a 20% reduction, 25%, whatever the case might be, they are net net paying almost what they were before, but now they are getting truly customized spaces that are going to hopefully draw their employees back into the office, but at the same time, you know, serve as a recruiting tool. And, you know, I've seen, it's interesting, you know, a couple of the top agency brokers in Pittsburgh have been talking about this for the past couple months, but as I've been traveling across the country, you know, for SIOR, I'm hearing such a consistency, whether it's New York City, whether it's Pittsburgh, Dallas, Houston, Los Angeles, et cetera, what we're seeing is something that is very common. And again, it's that flight to quality. So when you see a common trend, you know, let's be realistic. If something's happening in New York and Pittsburgh, there's something to it. So mm -hmm. while corporations may not all be on the same page with respect to what their goals are, when they're going to get employees back to the office, how many days people are going to be mandated to work in the office versus at home, they are all seeing that they have to improve what their office space is going to be. And the idea of just doing a renewal in a class B facility that hasn't been upgraded in the past 10 years, it's not necessarily going to happen other than doing maybe a one year extension, two year extension, because again, you need to get your employees to want to come back into the office and you're going to have to provide some kind of incentive for them to do that. And one of the most important things that we've all seen, and this is in our industry, as well as a lot of other industries, we're all better when we can start talking with other people in our shops. You know, when I can go in and talk to our retail teams, when I can go in and talk to our investment teams or our debt and finance teams, I learn so much more, which in turn can create potential opportunities for our clients and then vice versa. That's not happening on the phone. That's not happening, you know, to the same level, you know, on Zoom and Teams, which have been fantastic for so many things. It's just you need to have that personal interaction. And most corporations are saying, hey, we know we need to do that. We just have to figure out when we can you know, truly get everybody back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're certainly seeing that on the industrial side as well. There's that flight to quality and and the the real new modern warehouses with the 28 foot ceilings and and uh, uh, ESG in mind. Those, those are th th there's high demand for that, but there's still that a huge chunk of the inventory, not just in industrial but in office as well. That is that B or C class inventory. Right. What what do you what do you think happens to that inventory going forward? As as there is that flight to quality. I don't mean to be provincial, but I'll talk Pittsburgh again. Uh, one of the things that truly helped our downtown market uh, during the financial crisis, you know, in 07, 08, 09, uh, was we had a university come in uh, who had been in Pittsburgh forever, Point Park, uh, but they came in and bought a bunch of those older BB minus buildings and converted them into student housing and to classroom space. That took a huge chunk of our older inventory out of the market. Since that time, we've probably had at least four other older office buildings that have become apartments. So we have more people living in downtown Pittsburgh now than probably at any point in the past century. And in many, many cases, those are in what used to be you know, older office buildings that have a lot of character from the outside. So once those conversions go on, then that allows, again, you know, the top three or four buildings, they're all still killing it. But then the next four or five, they then can start putting money into their buildings, maybe not at the exact same level as the higher end class A's, but they could put more money into it. And the tenants that are in some of these other buildings might pay, again, a dollar or two more, but they're going to get out of those B minus buildings, as I'll call them, and then get into a B plus A minus. So I do expect that it's going to happen over time. It's not going to be something that's going to be in place, you know, for a, you know, in a year or so, um, but it's going to take time. You know, I was talking 
with you know one of my friendly competitors who's been in the market for over 40 years the other night. And I'm like, when are you going to retire? And as he said, he goes, well, I still haven't figured that out, but I can promise you I will be retired before we're back to a full recovery. And I'm like, ah, it's good news and bad news all wrapped in together. Um, <laughs> so it's going to take some time. Yeah. And it, that really does underscore the value of having an expert as either a broker or someone that that tenants relying on is to be ahead of these as opposed to being reactionary. And, and I think that that really does just speak to uh, a recommendation of just staying on top of trends all over the world, because what what's happening in London or Singapore is probably going to have some spillover into markets everywhere. So I, I'm a big fan of, of trying to stay on top of big uh, of global trends like that as well. And, and that's that leads next into uh, the SIOR, which I, I really want to uh, get your your comments on and and maybe even just a, a high level overview of SIR because you and I are both familiar with it, obviously. But uh, for people that that aren't familiar with it, maybe you could just give a, an overview of it as well. Oh, absolutely, Chad. So I am blessed to be the SIR global president. Uh, spent the past two years as president elect. It was only supposed to be one year, but you know, due to COVID, we extended that another year and then was vice president the year before that. So basically, for the past three and a half years, I have been a brand ambassador of this organization, which has 3,600 members, 42 countries, and 48 chapters. And some of our chapters could be as small as, I think, our smallest is maybe 13 or 14 members, but we have some that have 180 members. We have some chapters, like I know our chapter, where all but two of our members, you know, are in downtown Pittsburgh, um, whereby we have other chapters where it could be a six hour drive between uh, each of the two groups of membership. But the one common denominator is everybody who's an SAOR has been doing brokerage work at a high level for an extended period of time. And it's not just high levels of production, but it's high levels of you know, ethics as well. You know, we want to make sure that if one of my competitors calls me and just wants general market information, I will absolutely give them general market information because I'm not trying to, you know, hold all of that to my vest. Um, but it, you know, I'm not going to ever give client information or in this case, CBRE information to anybody else, but I am there to help, you know, our fellow SIORs, you know, so they could call me at any point in time and absolutely be in a position to at least know what's going on in the Pittsburgh market, for example. And at the same time, I know that, you know, I could, there's a number of people I could call ranging from Warsaw, Poland to, you know, Des Moines, Iowa, you know, to downtown LA where I can get that same information because of the cooperation we have among our 3,600 members. Yeah, I've been a member for the last five years and it's the, it's the single best organization I've ever been involved in. So kudos to you and the leadership team for everything you've done to steer it in this direction. A uh, question from Neil. Uh, Neil, thanks for joining in the question. How do brokers become a member of SIOR? Uh, what credentials and experience do they need to have? No, that's perfect. It's a great question because, again, as I said, we have 48 chapters. So first and foremost, you go on to SAOR.com and you can figure out which chapter you would belong to based upon where you reside and where you conduct your business. Then at that point in time, you'll see that we basically have two different categories. The predominant membership and our regular membership is you know someone that has been in the industry for five years and while the production level will differ a little bit be from chapter to chapter um you know for example if you are you know a broker in morgantown west virginia your production doesn't have to be as high as it would be in los angeles but um, the reality of it is you still would have to have a production that will be on the higher end of that particular market and if I recall correctly, you know, we had been for years, four out of five years, you'd have to be at a certain level of gross production uh, because of COVID, uh, specifically on the office side, you know, we're now, you know, three of the past five years. But again, that is the kind of stuff that we juggle on an, an annual basis to make sure that we are still getting the best of the best, but at the same time, not penalizing people in markets just because, you know, you have some little thing called a pandemic that just changes how you do business. And so we want to make sure that we're reactionary there. 
But the other thing, and this is really important, we have created a member associate program. And the reason that we've done that is we want to make sure that the best and brightest of the younger commercial real estate practitioners have a pathway to become an SLR. I was very fortunate because the people that hired me, uh, the two were SILRs. So I knew that I wanted to be an SILR literally from the day that I started. So I was fortunate enough that my production level was hit before I had my five years in the business. So I literally became, it was almost anticlimactic because as soon as a certain day was hit, I became an SILR. Uh, unfortunately, I was kind of the exception. Most people don't know about that early on in their careers. So our member associate program is designed for somebody that has been doing this work for or doing brokerage for at least a year, but has been in the business for under seven years so that you can you know, look at it. And as long as you are doing at least half of the production of what it would take to become an SOR, you can then become a member associate, which, as I said, is the entry level into uh, our organization. And then from that standpoint, the goal is to have mentors, not only in your chapter, but also through SIOR Global Headquarters that are going to help you you know, on your pathway you know, over the next three, four, five years of your career to become an SIOR. But the first thing to do is to figure out what chapter you're in. And then at that point in time, we can help you uh, figure out what you would need to do. Yeah, great explanation. And I'd also add on that SIORs as, as a whole are, are, are always open to chat. Uh, so I, I, I'm always happy if anyone has a question related to SIOR uh, or CCM. Uh, I'm always available to answer a question on that. And, and, and I'm sure that uh, if someone had a specific question about SIOR, you'd be happy to connect with them as well, Patrick. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And, uh, and, and honestly, even if you're just a young broker new to the industry, feel free to reach out to me. That is one of the things that I'm most passionate about. I want to help our organization get younger and get more diverse. You know, it is a business like many that, you know, people got into it only because they knew their father or their mm -hmm. aunt, uncle, whatever, were involved. We want to get that change. I mean, I, again, I was fortunate enough to be brought in without knowing what the industry was like. But there are so many other good brokers who could just be phenomenal in our industry. And if personally I can help them, you know, you know, we'll give my information at the end here, but they can reach out to me via text, call, email, et cetera. And I will absolutely take time to at least give them some background and some recommendations as to what they can do. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the culture at SIOR. And I'd, I'd give kudos to yourself and Mark Duclo, uh, president uh, from last year, as well as Robert uh, Thornburg, the new CEO, who was a broker uh, himself for many years and also an SIOR. Uh, your guys' leadership team is is doing some awesome things, just staying in front of everybody and really uh, displaying the value that SIOR has has to offer. Uh, so we, we will leave your contact information uh, either in the chat or we'll talk about it at the end. Uh, but I, I want to get your thoughts on just commercial real estate education as a whole. And I think that this is applicable for brokers on the full spectrum from a beginning agent all the way up to someone that just wants to take their business to the next level. Where would you steer someone right now that wants to learn more about some element of commercial real estate? So I think there's really, in my opinion, the two best places are through SAOR and CCIM. Uh, CCIM is phenomenal for those who don't really have a background in finance or investment. They can really help you understand that side of the business. And as we all know, while that might not be a huge portion of what we do, we absolutely have to understand the numbers to be successful in our industry. I was fortunate and candidly, the only reason I didn't do at CCIM was I was a finance major, spent two years as a credit analyst in a bank where all I did was review financial statements on a daily basis and then became a lender. If I didn't have that background, CCIM would have been the perfect entry level to get that side of the business understood. SAOR then can take you into a completely new level, you know, from our ethics classes to our development classes, to our construction classes, to understanding a lease class. They are taught by very seasoned professionals in some of the 
best brokers in the industry who also happen to have a gift to be able to teach. And it's really exciting to see some of the classes that, you know, some of these instructors are putting together for not only new members, but also prospective members who may have been in the industry for 10 or 15 years. They can all learn, you know, something from our SIOR classes. Yeah, and, and I echo both of those comments, uh, particularly about the instructors. Is the the instructors are industry practitioners who have extensive knowledge in the industry and extensive knowledge about the topic they're teaching, and it is is just world class education. So I, I do, I'm a big fan and encourage people to check out both. I, I think uh, why we put up uh, links to both on their SIOR and CCM if you want to learn more. And uh, like Patrick said, both of our our doors are open. So if you have any questions about either, we're we're always happy to chat. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to see if anyone has uh, any other questions. Uh, happy to chat about anything. Uh, if you want to talk about the office market, if you want to talk about uh, uh, SIOR, you want to talk about education, what brokerages should do. I think Patrick and I are, are pretty much willing to cover uh, any question you have in mind. Uh, if we've already ans answered all the questions that have come up, and, and again, we'll give a few minutes here if, if anything does come to mind. Uh, I want to get your your uh, thoughts on 2022, w what you're focusing on, what your mission is, and that can be business-wise or SIOR-wise, uh, and what does it look like as you're planning out 2022 and beyond? The most important thing that we're seeing in 2022 is really understanding what a client's needs are. In the past, that had always been, you go in, you ask the questions, you get the answers, and you try to formulate it from there. Now, it's actually going in, meeting with the client, and brainstorming with them. Uh, I have had a number of you know clients who have called uh, over the past six months saying, hey, we have some leases coming up in the next couple of years. We really want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. You know, does it make sense for us just to renew? You know, it's one thing to make sure that, you know, we save a dollar or two rent wise here or there. But more importantly, are we utilizing our space the right way? Are we, you know, creating an atmosphere that makes it good for our employees to want to come into the office, as I was talking about before? And in some cases, um, I do truly expect groups to start downsizing because they're going to realize that, hey, even though I've been in this space for the past 15 years and I actually have more employees than I did in the past, doesn't necessarily mean you still need the same amount of square footage. So these are the kind of conversations that we're having now with clients that are exciting because you know there's no more cookie cutter type scenarios involved here it's truly making sure that we understand the market and then understand the clients and in essence that's what 2022 has been i mean in some cases we've already seen some major successes you know in other cases you know candidly we're starting to see some things that are creating some issues on the industrial side you know where you might have in the past you know, you only needed six or nine months in advance in order to make sure that you properly are able to understand the market. We've had some markets where there are no other options and landlords, you know, are asking whatever they want to ask, you know, rental rate wise. So now it's looking at it and saying, well, guys, time out. We need to start this process a year in advance and not just, you know, getting a survey, but actually really understanding what your operation needs to be. So these are conversations that in some cases are a little uncomfortable, but they're really important so that, you know, we can truly help our clients long term. So that was kind of a, a long winded answer to what 2020 is like or 2022 is like, um, which candidly is a lot like 2020. <laughs> uh, but it's just we are all learning uh, what needs to be done. And there is definitely a need for more collaboration you know, with clients in it any time ever before. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a great point. Uh, question from Neil. What countries uh, industrial markets are growing the most with the new industrial demand? It's well, obviously the United States has just gone crazy, but we I've probably heard Mexico mention more in the past yes. three months than I have you know, since NAFTA, to be honest with you, uh, because now, you know, you're starting to see, you know, China is raising their wages. So you don't necessarily have that wage benefit that you had at one point in time. And then you start looking, do I want to have my supply chain disrupted, you know, that far away 
when in reality, I could literally be an hour away from the Texas border and have everything put together. So uh, I do fully expect to see Mexico uh, increase pretty dramatically over the next couple of years. Yeah, I just talked to a company in Mexico that's marketing a new industrial park and and their marketing package was as good as any marketing package I've seen anywhere. Uh, it, uh, that any misconception that people have that that they're behind us is completely false because what they're doing to build out cutting edge industrial parks is is at a level that I had no idea about. So I, I agree. I'm here in Mexico all the time. I think that, that that will be an opportunity for companies to onshore, reshore product uh, while still having competitive wages without having all these travel delays that come from container ships being uh, docked at sea and not being able to board, they can still have all that production in North America with a quick pipeline up to US and Canada. So oh, by the way, we also have some really strong SIORs down in Mexico. So that is a good growth chapter. And you know, in fact, I was just on the phone with them last week trying to get uh, some programs put in place for me to come down and actually meet with their entire team, uh, hopefully later this summer. Well, if it was if it was January, I'd say, can I tag along on that? Because <laughs> where I am, it's pretty cold right now. I wouldn't mind being in Mexico for for a couple of weeks. Wouldn't be no a bad thing. So you've got exposure to uh, markets all over the world. What are you hearing in in some of like the European countries? Is it similar narrative to North America with huge demand for industrial and uncertainty with with office and retail markets? There is definitely a consistency there. There is no doubt about that. Um, we are seeing the major players that we have here in the United States, you know, one being one of SOR's biggest uh, sponsors, Prologis. You know, Prologis has as much going on, you know, in the, in the Americas as they do in Europe and Asia. Uh, and th there's a reason for that. You know, they might want to be, hey, we want to help all markets. But the reality of it is it tells you how much business there actually is throughout the world. And so you're seeing, you know, the bigger groups now heading to a number of countries and candidly, it's just like here in the United States, you figure out geographically where you need to be to serve, you know, the major corporations, you know, the big boxes that we all see popping up across the country and across the world. And then once those groups are up, then you start realizing what the other manufacturers and distributors need. And so just like we have in the United States, you have the same thing over in Europe as well. Yeah, it's it, well, it goes back to that comment. We're probably sounding a bit redundant on it, but what's happening in in one place is is going to follow that same kind of trajectory uh, in other places. Uh, question from Maria. Uh, thanks for joining in, and thanks for the question, Maria. Uh, what pulse are you reading on mixed use developments? And and I'm guessing you do see this in in uh, areas right now where there is that uh, either main floor of retail and multifamily above it, uh, or even in some cases it might be hotel and office space. I, I know we're seeing that in our downtown market. So what what are you seeing right now in mixed use developments? This ties in exactly with what we were talking about before with the flight to quality. Because when you are in a mixed use development, you then have very cool restaurants, very cool fitness centers, very cool workout facilities, massage centers, whatever the case might be. So that, you know, you may be on the fourth floor of a you know, five story building, you know, with a lot of natural light coming in. But knowing that even if it's a cold day like it is in our uh, markets, you can just walk downstairs and be able to have access to some phenomenal amenities. And it's a win-win for the ownership of those buildings as well, because, you know, they're providing the amenities for the office tenants while at the same time receiving some pretty strong rents uh, from these groups. So it is a scenario where the right mixed use developments are still seeing Interest, or interest rates, rental rates increasing. So while, you know, in a lot of our downtown markets, as I, we were saying before, in the BB minus buildings, you know, you're not seeing, you know, any, you know, increases in rental rates. In fact, you're seeing decreases at the best mixed use developments. You're seeing higher rental rates and then getting one and a half, two, two and a half, even 3% annual escalations in your rents. So there's a reason for that. And that is because tenants want to be in these mixed use developments. Yeah, great point. I, I was talking to an urban planner uh, late last year, and he actually brought up a really interesting point on these mixed use developments, uh, particularly as it pertains to 
uh, institutional uses, like call it a police station or a, a hospital or a fire hall or even like a museum, a lot of the time these buildings are standalone buildings. And whether that's just municipal policy or or they just don't want to be intersecting these, his comment was, this is a perfect opportunity for these uses to actually integrate mixed use developments. Uh, because you can imagine if there is a hospital and, and then there is a uh, 10 levels of multifamily above it, or it was tied in with some office or tied in with, with general retail, there's a huge opportunity for uh, integrated uh, vertical development where they can tie into all these amenities, like you said. So I, I, I hope that some of those city policies get relaxed over time so that we can see some more of these mixed use developments with that non-traditional types of uses mixed into it. I completely agree because if you think about it, a lot of those facilities are going to have integrated parking as part of it. Mm -hmm. So you are not going to have a need for, you know, large parking lots that, you know, again, a lot of municipalities want to make sure that they're maximizing, you know, number one, the developments, but also they want to have as much green space as possible. So yeah. if you're going to have your parking, your retail, your office, and maybe some of these other types of uses all in the same vertical, that's actually a really big win. So you're right. Hopefully that some of these municipalities will think outside of the box and realize that it could be a great situation for a number of different entities. Yeah, that would be just another thing to uh, to follow along with uh, as, as we go forward on that. Uh, so last word I'll, I'll give to you on that. Uh, uh, first, uh, how can people get in touch with you and then any closing remarks you might have as well? Oh, absolutely. So first and foremost, you know, my cell phone is 412-759- Four nine nine one, and my email address is simply Patrick dot Sentner S E N T N E R at cbre dot com, and even though I'm traveling a ton for S O R, mm -hmm. I am always available. And you know, especially if you want to just reach out to me and say, "Hey, are you going to be in my market?" I can tell you right now, looking at our travel schedule for the next you know nine or ten months. Uh, I think I've been in about 16 or 17 chapters over the past six months. I will be at at least another 25 to 30 over the next nine. So, you know, if I'm going to be in a market where you might be, hey, just reach out and maybe we can grab coffee or even a drink afterwards. Yeah, fantastic. And and we'll also put uh, your LinkedIn in the show notes as well as your uh, uh, cell number and your email. Uh, and, I, and I really do just want to thank you for taking the time uh, to jump on this call with me and, and explain everything as clearly as you did. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of SIR. I'm a big fan of what you and the leadership team are doing. So I, I'd I encourage people to, uh, to check it out, uh, both connect with you and check out SIR. Uh, Maria, uh, thank you guys. Very enriching information. Thank you so much for joining in and the questions as well. Uh, last uh, a quick note, I've got a video coming out on Friday uh, about warehouse loading. Uh, I've been working on it for a while uh, and it just it, it took me a long time, but that is what will be coming out on Friday. So if you could check that out, that'd be great. And if you got any value from this, I'd really appreciate you liking and subscribing. And again, please connect with Patrick. Patrick, thanks so much. Really appreciated our chat.